Lord of Mysteries, Chapter 805, Meeting Up, Inside the Building of the Relic Search and Preservation Foundation, Audrey, whose thoughts were undergoing an upheaval, blinked. She took note of her body language and expressions as she drew a crimson moon on her chest in a half-genuine manner. She said with a sigh, what a tragedy. I hope that their spirits can rest in peace. The reason she had guessed that the archaeological team had comprised of members of the psychology alchemists was that she had previously received a mission to help the organization obtain a notebook related to the 20-year war from Associate Professor Michelle. And this notebook belonged to the knight from Hartlark Village, Linda Lira. Back then, Audrey had made a request to Mr. Fool and relied on magic mirror divination to determine the origins of the notebook. She discovered that it was deeply connected to the village that worshipped dragons, as she knew ahead of time that there was a mind dragon hiding within the sea of collective subconscious. She ultimately chose to hand over the notebook to the psychology alchemists in consideration of her lacking sequence and strength. That also meant that the psychology alchemists had quite a significant chance of locking onto Hartlark Village through the notebook before heading over to find their target. Another factor that Audrey used in her judgment was the strange mental illness that the archaeological team suffered. It had spread like a plague, causing the people to go mad in batches. In the real world, there was a probability that mental illnesses were hereditary, but it was almost impossible to be contagious. But in the mysterious world, in the world of the mind and consciousness, chaos and madness could be spread to others through spirit channeling, dreams, and the subconscious, and hidden in Hartlark Village was a mind dragon that had lived for years. The psychology alchemists had found Hartlark Village through the notebook, and the threatened mind dragon used this ingenious method to spread mental corruption. He might have achieved this through the sea of collective subconscious. The Bayonder world sure is dangerous. This small team must have been formed by a selection of Bayonders, but they ended their lives in such a simple and ridiculous manner. As Audrey thought about it, she was glad that she had made a sufficiently rational decision. She hadn't willfully used the knight's notebook to explore Hartlark Village. Otherwise, there would probably have been an addition named to the list of members who went mad. Thanks to Mr. Fool. Thanks to the other members of the Tarot Club. Thanks to Kalangos who previously infiltrated in disguise. They allowed me to still recognize the hidden dangers despite my lack of actual experience in the domain of mysticism. It made me sufficiently cautious. Audrey silently thought in gratitude. At that moment, her recalling her performance when she first joined the tarot club had made her wish to bury her head in her pillows to roar at herself. Audrey, you were that naive and immature back then. Thankfully, you met Mr. Fool. If it were any other secret existence, you would have long gone mad or turned into a monster. Mr. Fool is such a nice man. No, such a nice orthodox god. By the side, Associate Professor Michel noticed that Audrey had been silent. He said with a heavy nod, Yes, it truly is a tragedy that strikes one with fear. I only wish that the government has already handled the matter and prevented the contagious mental illness from becoming a plague. Don't worry, unless that mind dragon loses control and plans to challenge the three churches, there won't be any more victims of that mental illness. Audrey replied silently. From her point of view, the official Bayonders had already taken on the case. After all, a contagious mental illness was definitely going to be under the purview of the official Bayonders. Therefore, the dragon coat of arms in the glass case must have been determined to be fine before being donated to the foundation. The police department didn't have such authority. While Audrey felt pity for the archaeological team who were suspected to be psychology alchemists' members, as though she had experienced the tragedy for herself, she was curious if the mind dragon remained in the vicinity of Hartlark Village. To hide in the sea of collective subconscious with one's actual body would probably make it difficult to be discovered. However, the three churches have a long history. In the fourth epoch or even earlier, they must have had bouts with mind dragons, so perhaps they have the corresponding records about it. Besides, the psychology alchemist is in control of the spectator pathway and has the existence of high-sequence bayonders. Their comprehension of the sea of collective subconscious can't be much weaker than the mind dragons. After suffering a terrible failure due to the lack of information, they will definitely send a very powerful team. Hum. Although that mind dragon was stronger than what the psychology alchemists expected, it probably wouldn't stay there to be discovered. It should have left. Audrey made an inference based on what she knew. She didn't have any thoughts of visiting Hartlark Village to figure out the truth, because she long knew that the present her lacked the strength to deal with the mind dragon. Her only intentions were to mention the matter at the next tarot club, and see if the other members could provide any feedback or any valuable knowledge. 
For example, it might be that the mind dragon had entered the sea of collective subconscious because of the local worship of dragons, or it could be that the mind dragon's inhabitation of the sea of collective subconscious caused the villagers to dream of it, thus being subconsciously influenced and having the tradition of worshipping the dragon. On Friday afternoon, Klein received the invitation list for the ball tomorrow. He began to seriously memorize the topics he needed to discuss with different guests. When meeting Member of Parliament Macht, I need to make remarks about the recent good air in Backlund, and make a few jokes about the Lone Kingdom Imperial Science Institute. As Klein memorized each line, he suddenly heard stacked illusory pleas. A man, based on how long it's been, it's most likely Mr. Hanged Man. In thought, Klein put down the piece of paper in his hand and gulped down a mouthful of black tea before leaving the half-open room with the big balcony to head for the master bedroom's bathroom. He took four steps counterclockwise and went above the gray fog, and he discovered that it was indeed the hanged man. This man had requested the honorable fool to inform the world that he had arrived at the capital of the Rorsted Archipelago, City of Generosity, Bayam. He could head for the primitive island in two days after he replenished his supplies. He wanted the world to begin preparations so that they could meet in time. He also indicated that if he lacked the means to head for the primitive, he could arrange for the world to secretly board the Blue Avenger. Board the Blue Avenger and bring a bunch of sailors from the Church of Storms to the vicinity of the primitive island. How long can the Sanguine's anesthetic gas you bought from Imlin last? Will there be enough time to explore? Klein thought for a moment and conjured the world jam and sparrow, making him pray devoutly. There's no need to go through that much trouble. You should have freedom of movement and bam. Meet at the cemetery outside the city at midnight today. Before that, replenish your stores. Bayam, in an inn. Alger frowned slightly after hearing the world jam and sparrow's words. He did have freedom of movement in the city of generosity. This was because the sailors were eager to head to places like the Red Theater. They were definitely not returning tonight, and after waking up in the day, it was almost certain that they would head to a casino to gamble to let themselves loose. It was to vent the repression and misery that resulted from drifting out at sea for extended periods of time. That also meant that even if Alger disappeared for a night and a day, no one would discover it. Is the world implying that we use this interval? That is indeed better than using the Sanguine's anesthetic gas. I've already used it twice, so who knows if someone is already suspicious about it and is waiting for his theory to be validated. But without a ship, how do we head for the primitive island? Oh, Leimano's travels. This magician did mention that it has the Bayonder power of teleportation. However, there's only one page, making it impossible for a return trip. Alger relied on his strong ability to connect matters to vaguely guess at Jam and Sparrow's intent, but he believed that the necessary conditions were lacking. With these doubts in mind, he found his contact with the Resistance and replenished his storm charms that were made with tin. When it was eleven at night, Alger secretly left his inn and headed out of the city under the shadows. He wasn't worried that the sailors would discover his disappearance because he too had physical needs. It was possible that he was sleeping in a lady's bed in the Red Theater and was unwilling to return. And there were many such brothels in Bayam, with many prostitutes in existence. It was impossible to say that there was something wrong with him because he wasn't at the Red Theater. Once he left Bayam, Alger walked on a narrow road where horse carriages couldn't pass as he headed for the mountainside of the mountain range beside the sea. Suddenly, his gaze froze as he noticed something. Under the crimson moonlight's illumination, the mountain that originally existed had vanished, and the area underneath, such as the piled stones, vegetation, and terrain, changed almost completely. This, Alger had come from the Resistance's private harbor earlier. He hadn't managed to pay close attention to the mountain, hence, he only noticed the abnormality at that moment. The mountain collapsed. It actually collapsed, right? It was previously mentioned in the papers that Bayam encountered a shallow earthquake, with its might being focused in the mountain range outside the city. Also, the church's deacon said that Jam and Sparrow nearly destroyed Bayam, and that matter had demigods involved. Both of them occurred during the same period. Could it be caused by Jam and Sparrow? He instigated a demigod-level battle, and he managed to successfully escape while killing Admiral of Blood. Alger's pupils dilated as his footsteps slowed down to a halt. He suddenly understood why the Church of Storms had placed great importance on Jam and Sparrow, and why he had a bounty worth as much as 50,000 pounds. In the undamaged cemetery up ahead, a cold wind blew across it and towards Alger in the silent night. It made him tremble involuntarily. At that moment, Alger's heart stirred as he turned his head to look right. Underneath a giant tree, a figure quickly outlined itself in the shade. 
This figure had his hand on his top hat while he slowly looked up, revealing a thin face and cut features. The emotionless dark brown eyes were none other than Jame and Sparrows. Chapter 806 Entering the island in the middle of the night he did teleport over. How extravagant. Alger tensed up before relaxing. However, he did not let his guard down at all. Upon meeting Jam and Sparrow again, he discovered that there wasn't much of a change to him. However, his every action had the indescribable air of a powerhouse, and the profundity he exuded left him apprehensive. As expected of the crazy adventurer who can instigate a battle of demigod proportions while escaping unscathed. The slight bit of smugness of having become a Sequence 5 vanished from Alger. He slowly walked over with lantern in hand. When he saw Jame and Sparrow, he deliberately probed. The traces you left behind might not vanish for the next few centuries or even millennia. He was trying to confirm if the mountain's collapse had anything to do with Jame and Sparrow. Klein shot a glance at the modified terrain as he released his grip on his top hat and smiled in a gentlemanly manner. The one who contributed the most in causing this damage was Sea King. Man, he actually triggered a demigod battle that could have destroyed Bam, causing Sea King to directly attack. Yet, despite such circumstances, he survived and left with Admiral of Blood. It's completely unimaginable and unbelievable. Alger began to suspect if Jamin Sparrow had a grade 1 sealed artifact on him, an item at the demigod level. He didn't express his shock and surprise, nor did he dare to probe further. Instead, he asked, Do you plan on heading to that primitive island now? Of course, Klein answered calmly. It was late at night, a period when Duane Dantes was asleep. No one would disturb him, but he had to show himself once it was daytime. Of course, to prevent any unexpected circumstances, Klein had summoned arrows to monitor the mirror illusion and provide a response. It's thanks to the Church of Evernight for having ended its dream treatment of Mr. Tycoon. Otherwise, I would definitely have to delay the operation. Klein couldn't help but sigh inwardly. Alger observed himself and discovered that he wasn't able to obtain any mystical item in such a short span of time. He then took out an iron black ring that protruded out like a thorn and wore it on his left thumb. Bearing with the excruciating headache, he nodded slightly. I hope for a pleasant partnership. Then, he saw Jame and Sparrow walk over with a stoic expression, reach out his hand, and grab his shoulder. At that instant, Alger's first reaction was that Jame and Sparrow was attacking him. He instinctively wanted to turn to the side to dodge his attack, only to recall his previous guess. Amidst his racing thoughts, he withheld his subconscious reaction and allowed the crazy adventurer to place his palm on his left shoulder. Right on the heels of that, he noticed Jame and Sparrow's left hand turn transparent as though it was bearing the shadows of the spirit world. Then, the blacks before his eyes grew darker, and the crimson moon turned brighter. All kinds of colors seemed to layer upon one another. Countless nearly formless figures receded backwards as Alger tore through the spirit world with Jame and Sparrow's help. Creeping hunger. Teleport. So that's how it is. Just as he had such a thought surface in his mind, he saw his body plummet as the saturated colors around him receded. Everything had returned to normal. Beach. Reefs. Trees. This is a deserted island. Alger surveyed the area and was just about to speak when the colors around him saturated as the layered phenomenon happened once again. This time, when he left the spirit world, he was in midair with undulating waves beneath him. Although Alger had never worked with Jame and Sparrow in actual combat before, the experienced him immediately created a spiraling wind and allowed them to float. It was a tacit display of teamwork. Hence, the teleportation triggered successfully once again as Alger's and Jame and Sparrow's figures rapidly phased away. When the surroundings were restored again, the two had arrived at the periphery of a gigantic island. There was a heavy mist in midair that the crimson moonlight was unable to fully penetrate. This not only failed to disperse the darkness in the forest and mountain, but it also added an eerie charm to it. We're here, Alger said as he looked around. Klein wore an indifferent expression, but in fact, he was cautiously observing his surroundings. He found the place extremely quiet. There weren't any birds tweeting, wolves howling, or bugs chirping. It exuded a deathly silence. As though guessing his feelings, Alger raised the lantern and illuminated the shrubs ahead where there was a natural trail made up of beast-type footprints. He said, if you come in the day, it will be quite a lively sight. You will even see birds that only exist in myths fly in the forest. But at night, the power that rules this place will change. Many Bayonder creatures will hide as they await daybreak. Mr. Hanged Man has come here more than once. At the very least, he has the experience of a day and night here. Klein silently nodded without speaking further. Alger thought for two seconds and pointed ahead. If we follow this trail and enter the dark forest all the way to the end, we will arrive at that ancient ruins of unknown age. On the way, we can hunt the Bayonder creatures that we encounter and are able to deal with. 
If it's killed independently, the corresponding ingredients will belong to the killer. Those we jointly kill will be held in your custody. When we leave this place, we can take turns to choose. We will determine the owner based on our contribution, to decide who has the priority to choose, as well as the number of priority choices. Instead of being in a rush to take action, he first made clear the route and the plan to split the loot. It was to prevent any conflict that would result from the exploration. To let me have custody of the loot we received from a joint kill. Mr. Hang Von is being very sincere. Klein raised his right hand and pressed down his half-top hat and chuckled. No problem. Alger heaved a sigh of relief and continued. Our main goal is to explore that ancient ruins. The spoils we obtain along the way are supplementary. Once we finish the exploration, it's best we leave immediately without heading to the other zones or taking other paths. As for anything in the future, it's up to you to decide when and where you would like to explore. Alger emphasized this matter because he was afraid of Jam and Sparrow's greed. After all, Beyonders were not perpetual machines. There was bound to be a point when they were exhausted. After a round of explorations, they were bound to be close to their limits. If they were to force themselves to hunt Beyonder creatures in other zones, perhaps the identities of hunter and prey would switch. Even if the crazy adventurer was very powerful and unafraid of such danger, to be in a state of drained spirituality would trigger signs of losing control. Do you think I'm not sharing the same thoughts as you? I'm the one worried that you'd be the one who's overly greedy, rashly proceeding deeper just to obtain more. Klein smiled and said, I'm a polite person. Polite. Alger was a little puzzled by Jamin Sparrow's choice of words. The corners of Klein's mouth curled as his expression turned darker in the darkness. When visiting someone's place for the first time, overstaying would be impolite. This fellow's train of thought and logical behavior is completely different from that of a normal person's. As expected of a crazy adventurer, Alger was first taken aback before he raised the lantern and took a step forward in the dim red shadows. Let's set off. Klein allowed his hands to naturally droop down as he walked beside Alger like he was on a hike. The two quickly entered the dark forest that had nearly zero moonlight shining in. They saw that the trees were thick and tall with luxuriant leaves. Even the smallest trees were thicker than the span of a person's arm. And the trait they all had in common was that the bark appeared scaly. They were densely packed together as though they would come to life or squirm at any moment. It's like a mutated drago tree. A snake-scaled tree. Klein retracted his gaze and noticed the weeds at his feet that didn't seem problematic. None of them spoke as they maintained a state of abnormal silence. They didn't wish to say anything to eliminate the awkwardness just because it was too quiet. As they walked, the duo saw the distribution of trees ahead turn sparser thanks to the lantern's light. Thump, 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 a dull knocking sound echoed through the area. As Alger and Jamin approached, it became clearer and more obvious. When the duo entered the sparse area, the lantern's light finally revealed hunched or prostrate figures. Amongst these figures were humans, baboons, goats, and tigers. They were either holding rocks or using their claws and teeth to constantly burnish the stacked trees and rocks as though they were building a palace. Without the obstruction from the luxuriant leaves, the crimson moonlight that penetrated the heavy mist cloaked these figures, dyeing them with a faint blood-red layer. There are humans. Klein's eyes focused as he immediately spread his left fingers. Alger slowed down, preparing his vocal cords to be activated at any moment. Suddenly, the figures seemed to sense something as they stopped their actions in unison before uniformly turning around to look at the two outsiders. They either had pale faces, withered skin, or festering bodies. None of them looked alive. Corpses. A Bayonder creature is driving these corpses to build a palace for it. Klein cast his gaze past them and saw a dark cave that led deep into the ground. The surroundings were covered in weeds as white feathers stained with yellow oil scattered among them. Feathers, corpses, these instantly reminded Klein of the products of the Numinous Episcopate's artificial death project, as well as the infectious aura that made him grow feathers. This zone sovereign won't be weak. He calmly made a judgment. At that moment, Alger, who had carefully observed for a while, hesitated for two seconds before suggesting, I've never seen such a situation before. I'm not sure of the level of the Bayonder creature. Why don't we circle around it and choose a target which we have more confidence in? His instincts told him that something extremely dangerous was hiding in the dark underground cave. I was waiting for you to say that. Maintaining his persona as Jam and Sparrow, Klein heaved a sigh of relief as he chuckled. Will this be impolite? Just as he said that, the land quaked as though a creature beneath them was rolling over in its bed. Chapter 807 Mediocre Luck Sensing the land quake, Alger's heart tightened as he glanced at Jam and Sparrow, using his actions to replace his words. The sound of wind howled beside him, allowing him to run more easily and quickly to the side. 
The reason why Alger had done so was because he was worried that Jaime and Sparrow would suddenly go mad and decide to hunt the terrifying creature inside the dark underground cave. If that were to happen, even if they ultimately clinched a victory, it would have been extremely disadvantageous for the subsequent explorations. As an experienced sailor, he knew that decisive action spurred companions who remained indecisive into subconsciously following his actions. Upon seeing this, Klein heaved a sigh of relief as he gave up the discussion about politeness. He widened his stride and ran behind the hanged man. Following that, he sensed a strong wind blow at his feet, thrusting him forward. This significantly reduced his need to overcome gravity, allowing him to obtain additional mobility that instantly doubled his speed. Amidst the rustling sounds, Klein and Alger ran out of the sparse woods and circled around the flank of the eerie darkness. At this moment, their heartbeats suddenly slowed. It was as though they hadn't been engaging in intense exercise and were instead in a state of reverie that resulted from the tanning of the afternoon sun. Klein immediately felt his body turn cold as an inexplicable and baffling sense of gloom arose as they tried invading his body. Meanwhile, he saw the light from Alger's lantern be swallowed inch by inch by a gigantic black shadow. A corresponding scene naturally surfaced in his mind. In the depths of the dark underground cave, a thick, humongous serpent snaked out. It had dark green scales with exaggerated eyes that seemed to burn with fire. In between its scales were white feather covered in yellow oily stains. Along its back was a pair of thick wings that could be spread. While slithering and flying, this giant serpent raised its body high, coiling itself around a thick tree and extending its pitch-black tongue. It stared intently at the two figures that had barged into the surrounding area. Around it, the trees were rapidly withering along with the weeds. Countless corpses burrowed out of the soil as invisible shadows surged to its side. Feathered serpent. It was a feathered serpent. In the southern continent, it was a symbol of holiness. It was the emblem of the descendants of death, the Eggers family. Klein and Alger didn't pause as they held back the coldness of their bodies and their slowing heartbeats. Under the intense winds, they charged into the depths of the dark forest, pulling a distance away from the sparse trees. Badump, badump, badump. The duo's heartbeats gradually returned to normal as the coldness of their bodies were dispersed by the heat generated from the intense exercise. Klein's spiritual intuition told him that the danger had passed. Hence, he slowed down his pace and turned to glance back. He said calmly while facing the depth of the darkness, a demigod-level feathered serpent. Demigod-level. Alger similarly slowed down as the blood vessel in his forehead pulsed. He paused for two seconds and exhaled lightly. Don't worry about it. The Bayonder creatures here are very territorial. Unless they wish to hunt, they will not enter other zones, especially when it's near the mountain. That feathered serpent wouldn't chase after us. Klein nodded and said, The Bayonder creatures here are very strong. Alger retracted his gaze and replied with a shake of his head. No, there are also many weak ones. I've been here at night before, but I've only discovered the traces left behind by Bayonder creatures at the demigod level without encountering them. I actually encountered one this time. Such matters are mainly about luck. The chances of this happening again isn't too high. As a seafarer, being able to calculate was a necessary ability. Are you looking down on me, the king of yellow and black who wields good luck? Klein gave a self-deprecating laugh as he said with a deadpan expression. Absolute judgments often result in the opposite results. When translated into earth speak, it was, don't raise death flags. In fact, if it wasn't a feathered serpent at the demigod level, and instead was something at sequence 5, Klein would be happy to bully it. After all, with Azik's copper whistle in hand, the Bayonder creatures in the Death Domain would lose at least half their combat strength. As for encountering a Bayonder creature at the demigod level, he wasn't too alarmed. This was because the Hanged Man had previously mentioned it, and he had made the corresponding preparations. He had the Fate Siphon Charm, three pages of demigod level Bayonder powers in Leimano's travels, and the ability to travel. Although it wasn't necessarily the case that he could resist a demigod, it was enough to help him create opportunities to escape. As long as I do not encounter angels, Klein silently added inwardly. After hearing Jamin Sparrow, Alger was somewhat puzzled. This was because the crazy adventurer was clearly informing him to be more careful and cautious. A cold and crazy fellow. That's right. If he's just crazy, he wouldn't have lived to this day. Alger looked up at the sky as he tried hard to look past the mist and distinguish the blurry stars. After two minutes, he retracted his gaze and pointed in a direction. We'll head in that direction. Klein had long drawn his iron black death knell. He allowed the muzzle to naturally point downward as he silently followed alongside Alger. He wore a cold and composed expression that had no signs of anxiety. After traversing the extremely dim forest for some time, Alger suddenly stopped. 
As he looked to his left, he said in a deep voice, If we head forward more, there will be an illusory chime tree. I hope to handle it by myself. The second Bayonder creature we encounter will be handled by you. I won't involve myself in the hunt, unless you can't handle it alone. Alger swallowed the second half of his sentence. He wasn't like the hunters who were often seen at sea, people who often couldn't hold their tongues as they habitually said things that infuriated others. The main Bayonder ingredient which Miss Justice needs. Mr. Hanged Man has quite a bit of adventuring experience under his belt. He knows that being frank at times is more useful than concealing matters, and that negotiating is more effective than scheming. Klein maintained Jamin Sparrow's persona as he nodded with a hint of gentlemanliness amidst his coldness. Okay, if you can't deal with it, it's best you shout for help, otherwise, I'll treat it as your persistence. The style of a crazy adventurer appears to be different from hunters, but in certain aspects, they are surprisingly similar. Alger silently drew a breath as he continued forward with his lantern. As they walked, they heard weak chiming sounds, and they immediately felt as though they were home their bodies and mind at ease. Klein acutely sensed that his wariness was melting away in an irreversible manner. No matter how much he emphasized it to himself, he was unable to tense up. At that instant, he even had the urge to head for the source of the chimes, believing that there was something extremely dear and familiar to him located over there. As they were quite a distance away, the chiming was sporadic. Klein was barely able to hold himself back as he turned to look at Mr. Hanged Man. Alger no longer looked as staid as before. The eyes of his rugged face were slightly red. It was unknown if he had recalled something that caused him to plunge into some emotional state. I wonder what Mr. Hanged Man looks like when he's crying. It must be quite terrifying. Klein couldn't help but muse. At this moment, Alger said softly with a hoarse voice, Leave it to me. Just as he said that, he put down the lantern and slightly turned the sinister ring on his left thumb. He made the protruded thorn that looked like it was stained with old bloodstains turn brighter. This was his mystical item, Whip of Mind. Its side effects was to place the wearer in a state of a constant headache, one so bad that the wearer would yearn to slam their head into a wall. However, at that moment, the excruciating headache made Alger maintain his basic lucidity amidst the chimes without being truly hypnotized. At times, a side effect might actually provide benefits to the wearer. As Alger remained poignant, he took out a wooden box from his pocket and snapped it open. Inside it was a gray rat. Mr. Hanged Man wishes to use the rat as bait, so as to attract the illusory chime tree's attention before taking the opportunity to attack it. Not bad. He made adequate preparations. He already had a detailed plan ahead of time. As an experienced adventurer, Klein instantly guessed the hanged man's thought processes. Alger held up the rat and shook it when his expression suddenly turned odd. The gray rat was no longer moving. It wasn't breathing and was cold. It wasn't able to take on the responsibility of being bait. Back when they encountered the demigod-level feathered serpent, although Alger was in the periphery of the entity's focus and had escaped quickly without being overly affected, the gray rat he carried with him was only an ordinary animal. It didn't have a strong constitution and vitality, so it perished from the effects of the feathered serpent. It's dead. It's dead. Mr. Hanged Man now understands a principle. Plans often can't keep up with change. His luck is mediocre. Upon seeing this scene, Klein couldn't help but twitch the corners of his mouth. He wanted to laugh, but he didn't make a sound, afraid that it would destroy his persona. Such situations were rare to the experienced and meticulous hanged man. Alger quickly reined in his emotions as he proceeded forward with the dead gray rat. Klein bent down and reached out for the lantern as he unhurriedly followed behind him. The chimes grew clearer as it made them more and more silent, with the urge to run towards it becoming greater. After taking another few steps forward, Klein finally saw that strange tree. Above its brownish-green trunk were thin cracks. Deep inside each crack was a darkness that looked as though different eyes were growing inside them. The branches that extended outwards had chime-like metal-gray objects hanging from them. They were swaying automatically, letting out melodious sounds. And on the branch closest to the trunk, there was a fist-sized, colorless, translucent fruit. Alger stared in that direction as he pressed at his throat before saying to Jamin Sparrow with a heavy voice, It's best you cover your ears and converge your spirituality. Chapter 808 Awful Singing Upon hearing the hanged man, Klein's heart skipped a beat. He had an ominous premonition as he ignored his persona, put down the lantern, and took out two slips of paper. He then crumpled them into a ball and stuffed them into his ears. Seeing Jam and Sparrow do it without any questions, Alger heaved a sigh of relief. He reflected on how nice it was to work with an experienced fellow. Even though he was an adventurer known to be crazy, he was someone who followed reasonable instructions. He knew what and what not to do. 
just as he was about to throw the dead rat which still retained some of its warmth at the illusory chime tree to divert its attention, he suddenly saw the shrubs shake as a yellow-skinned, black-striped tiger appeared. Amidst the melodic chimes, the tiger walked towards the strange tree normally, but its eyes were glazed over. It felt indescribably creepy. When Alger saw this, he lowered his arm and abandoned his attempt of throwing the dead rat. Resisting the headache, he calmly watched as the tiger walked closer to the tree due to the growing influence of the melody. It crouched down, raised its right claw, and bared its claws, slicing itself at the neck. Despite the oozing blood, the tiger seemed to have lost all sense of pain. It continued digging in deeper and gorging the wound before it began to skin itself, revealing a naked body covered in mangled flesh and blood. The chimes gradually weakened as the branch suddenly came alive. It extended downwards, stabbing into the tiger's sorry, unprotected body. Alger, who was already prepared, immediately drew his dagger, opened his mouth, and sang hoarsely, Break, 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 on thy cold grey stones, O C. Break, 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 at the foot of thy crags, O C. One. His voice had bold overtones, but it was completely out of tune. It was at complete odds with the comprehension of both humans and creatures. It was a jarring boom that had a metallic sound to it. It was filled with the power that left one frustrated and disgusted. Meanwhile, the illusory chime tree's branches trembled as they retracted like they were huddling together, following that a melodious chime lessened the terrifying noise to a small extent. At Alger's side, although Klein had used paper balls to stuff his ears and had converged his spirituality, he immediately felt his forehead's blood vessels throb. He instantly had the urge to kill the singer and destroy everything before him. Furthermore, his mind had the feeling of being ripped apart. His muscles and vessels were squirming as a result. Others charge people money to sing. But Mr. Hanged Man's singing charges you with death. Klein lampooned as he resisted the irascibility in his heart. Break, break, break. Every word Alger said burst out like waves striking reefs. Bolts of silver lightning descended in turns, as though in euphoric praise. As silver flashes lit up one after another, they smote down at the illusory chime tree's surface, causing it to tremble incessantly. Its branches shook in a numb and random manner, making it difficult for it to produce the melodic hypnotic music. Alger took this opportunity as he threw the dead rat and thrust the dagger in his hand forward. With a howling wind, invisible blades swooshed over, slicing at the branch at the top and nearest to the illusory chime tree's trunk. Katja, the colorless, palm-sized, translucent fruit fell as it was swept up by a gust of wind and flew into Alger's palm. The tree bark which was covered with eye-like cracks froze as the remaining branches drooped down, having lost their ability to move. Indeed, as long as you gather the correct intel ahead of time. Bayonder vegetation at the same level is a lot easier to deal with than animals due to its lacking intelligence. Alger took out a golden container he had prepared, and he put away the illusory chime tree's fruit. Then, he turned around to look at Jame and Sparrow. Let's continue. He suddenly stopped speaking as the word forward vanished from his vocal cords. At that instant, he saw Jame and Sparrow's cold expression looking somewhat warped. The whites around his brown irises were slightly red, as though he would unleash an attack upon him at any moment. Alger felt tense as he slowly drew a gasp and completed his sentence. Let's continue forward. Let's go, Jamin Sparrow replied softly. He first circled around the withered illusory chime tree and walked deep into the dark forest. He didn't get any bark, branches, or materials that were rich in spirituality, because they were bound to encounter many Bayonder creatures later. Furthermore, he didn't have any so-called storage artifacts. Naturally, he left whatever space he had for worthwhile spoils. Besides, having too many things on him would only weigh him down and prevent him from fully displaying the agility of a clown. Unfortunately, those are materials without any vitality, or blood, making it impossible to enter Grossel's travels. I can let my marionette bring them in but that will be very troublesome and detrimental to the subsequent exploration. As Klein sighed, he calmed his mind, extricating himself from the remnant effects of the hanged man's singing. This was the most jarring and terrible singing that he had heard in both his lives. If the hanged man continued for another one or two minutes, he couldn't guarantee that he could stop himself from beating him up. Using just paper balls to stuff my ears and converging my spirituality can only weaken the effects. There's no way to really block it out. Even a deaf person can hear it. This includes an exchange at the spirituality level. This is probably the most indefensible attack from an ocean songster. Furthermore, there's no way of dodging it once it happens. There's only lightning strike which can be dodged ahead of time. This is a rather powerful sequence 5 as well. However, why does Mr. Hangman's singing feel completely different from elvish songster Sayadas? As Klein summarized and analyzed his experience, he was somewhat puzzled. 
At this moment, the lantern holding Alger, who was walking beside him, couldn't help but consider a question. Even Jam and Sparrow can't stand my singing. How should I act as an ocean songster? In that silent environment, the two quickly proceeded forward amidst thick trees that appeared to be covered in snakeskin as they approached the ancient ruins. With a seafarer beside him, Klein saved himself the trouble of using dousing rod seeking. He focused on watching out for any sudden attacks. The dark and silent environment resembled a horror story. As the two proceeded forward for an unknown amount of time, they discovered that the trees were beginning to systematically become sparse. This was completely different from the situation back when they met the demigod-level feathered serpent. The trees there had abruptly become sparse, while what they were encountering now was a progressive change. It made them have the misconception that they were about to leave the dark forests. After passing through this zone, we will arrive at the periphery of the ancient ruins. Alger broke the silence. He paused and then added seemingly casually, based on my experience, it becomes more dangerous as we approach it. The signs of a demigod creature I found last time was around here. However, oddly, the periphery of the ancient ruins doesn't have any signs of beyonder creatures. However, I have no idea about deep inside it. This is probably because there's an even more terrifying existence inside the ancient ruins. That zone is its territory, so other creatures do not dare to approach. Klein mumbled inwardly. He had a sense for the danger level of this expedition. He had previously performed the corresponding divination above the gray fog, and the revelation he received was that it had its ups and downs, as well as its problems. However, leaving safely wasn't much of a problem. After the hangman said that, Klein chuckled. You likely know what my guess is. He didn't say anything further as he entered the zone with sparse vegetation. Alger silently walked beside him, increasingly convinced about his judgment of Jam and Sparrow. He was calm and crazy. After proceeding dozens of meters forward, they suddenly saw a pair of ghostly blue eyes situated at where the lantern's glow could reach. It was a black baboon crouched on a branch. Its fur was naturally curled, and its head grew black crystals. These crystals grew upwards in a random manner, forming a strange crown. Upon seeing the black baboon, Klein and Alger simultaneously had the urge to bow their heads to not look directly at it. They felt as though it was the ruler of the nearby region, their sovereign. Sovereign, Alger relied on the excruciating headache which the whip of mind brought him in order to escape its influence as he hurriedly took a step to the left in an attempt to avoid any direct clashes. He left the unknown Bayonder creature to Jam and Sparrow. They had agreed to it prior. However, despite walking to the left, he ended up walking forward. His legs also hobbled as though he suddenly needed crutches. Subconsciously, Alger drew his dagger, causing sharp wind blades to swish towards the curly-haired baboon. At that moment, the baboon grinned. The wind blades suddenly changed direction in midair, moving in every direction at random to perfectly avoid hitting the target. Upon seeing this scene, Klein gave up his plans on approaching through ordinary methods. His left glove instantly turned transparent as he turned invisible. Alger stopped his actions that resulted from his stress when he saw Jame and Sparrow in his top hat appear behind the black curly-haired baboon. The distance between them was less than five meters. Right on the heels of that, the black curly-haired baboon's body abruptly stiffened as though it lost control of most of its body. It even tried hard to raise its palm, trying hard to dig at its eyes in an attempt to distort something. And at this moment, Jamin Sparrow had already made use of this delay to raise the iron black revolver in his right hand, aiming the dark barrel at its head. Then, without any emotion, the crazy adventurer pulled the trigger. Chapter 809, The Danger Amidst the Darkness Chapter 809, The Danger Amidst the Darkness Translator, Atlas Studios Editor, Atlas Studios Bang! The loud gunshot reverberated in the sparse and open region as they extended outwards. If it was an ordinary island with an ordinary forest at night, it would have alarmed the birds and beasts, sending them scattering away. But here, everything remained quiet, so quiet that it didn't seem like any living creatures existed. As for that black curly-haired baboon, its head had burst open, splattering blood and brain matter everywhere like it was raining. The black crystal at its head shattered as well, with not a single piece remaining intact. Klein bent his arm and slowly retracted death knell which was still spewing out smoke. He watched as the mutated curly-haired baboon's stocky body, one more that was muscular than a human's, collapsed to the group. By approaching with traveling, forcefully controlling with Rafe, and seizing the opportunity to deal a lethal strike with Death Knell, it was an instant kill. Klein wasn't doing this to flaunt his strength, but via his observations, he believed that the mutated curly-haired baboon had unique powers. If he didn't quickly finish it off while it didn't understand anything about him, there was a very high chance that the situation would be reversed. 
making the battle rather tricky. Besides, on such a dangerous primitive island, it was imperative he avoided situations from escalating, for no one knew what things could be lured by an intense battle. Therefore, after Klein possessed the mutated curly-haired baboon with a wraith, he gave up on the more reliable and more unnoticeable method of controlling spirit body threads, because it took longer. Instead, he chose to cock the gun and use death knell to finish it off while it was stiff and slow as a result of the wraith's influence. The effects were identical to his expectations. The possible accidents that could happen midway were as he imagined. With the help of distortion and chaos, the mutated curly-haired baboon did possess the ability to extricate itself from the unfavorable situation of the wraith's possession, and it would allow the bullet's trajectory to violate the laws of physics and avoid its body. Unfortunately, its efforts had come to an abrupt stop before it could change any effects. Klein had seized that brief moment of sluggishness to decisively deliver the lethal strike. If he had switched to controlling spirit body threads, the outcome might have been very different. It's worth it to suffer a weakness for this. Furthermore, there's a higher chance of me being needed to use death knell later. Compared to realizing what I'm afraid of in a more dangerous environment, it's better to know the problem ahead of time and avoid similar situations. That's the better option. Klein allowed his revolver to point downward as he walked to the side of the mutated curly-haired baboon. At this moment, under the wraith's control, the Bayonder characteristic of the Bayonder creature rapidly appeared. Alger held up the lantern as he watched this scene from a distance away. It took him nearly a minute to snap back to his senses. Frozen in his mind was ultimately the scene of the flare from Jam and Sparrow's muzzle and the bursting head of the curly-haired baboon. The chaos they encountered in the beginning had made him understand that the Bayonder creature they had encountered was at a sequence higher than that of the illusory chime tree. It was a relatively difficult creature to deal with, one that required sufficient caution during combat. Furthermore, there wasn't any guarantee of victory. Yet, Jamin Sparrow had finished the battle in three seconds. The speed at which it happened was as though he was engaging in target practice. Being a sequence 5 Bayonder as well, the difference was unbelievable. Combining a short-distance teleportation ability and a strange power that can control an enemy for a certain amount of time, along with that astoundingly potent revolver, the effects are unimaginable terrifying. If I were to encounter it for the first time, I would definitely be killed instantly. And even if I'm prepared, it wouldn't be easy to resist it. The best solution is to use my singing to affect my surroundings indiscriminately. It will prevent Jam and Sparrow from successfully completing a teleport, as expected of a crazy adventurer with a bounty of 50,000 pounds. Even without Mr. Fool's help, just him alone isn't weaker than Admiral Hell. It's possible that he's even stronger. While sighing poignantly, Alger reigned in his thoughts as he considered how he could deal with the situation if he were in the curly-haired baboon's shoes. Compared to the descriptions from others and his own guesses, witnessing it himself was more convincing and shocking. Inside the corpse of the curly-haired baboon where the shattered black crystal was, a faint blob of light quickly appeared and converged together, turning into a translucent, pitch-black fist that was tightly clenched. Indifferently to their thoughts, the fist produced a feeling of strength and sinisterness. The palm's lines, luster, and fingernails seemed to follow ordinary principles, but they were filled with an abnormal charm. It seemed to hide large amounts of madness and chaos. Sequence 5 Mentor of Confusion from the Black Emperor Pathway I wonder what weakness I received. I hope it's not too odd. Hum, I can use death knell as much as I want in the next six hours. As Klein muttered, he bent down to pick up the Bayonder characteristic and stored it in a prepared metal container. In fact, he could attempt to graze the curly-haired baboon and see if he could obtain the corresponding Bayonder powers of a mentor of confusion so as to swap away his gloves barren of corruption. But ultimately, he gave up on that idea since he wasn't sure what the Bayonder creature had done that made it deserve such torture. His encounter had been an encounter on a battlefield. Ensuring his enemy's death was nothing out of the ordinary, but grazing was an extremely excruciating pain that left a soul yearning for liberation. Klein had his own principles and stubbornness. He didn't easily violate them, and he often cautiously chose his targets. Of course, to him, creatures of lower intelligence were not the same as humans. Even if he attempted to graze it, it wasn't crossing the line. However, many of his past experiences told him that persisting to keep to his principles and not relax the requirements for himself was not only a moral question, but was something to prevent himself from losing himself. He couldn't keep pushing the envelope just because he thought it was nothing. As the trivialities accumulated, it would eventually result in a terrible mistake. In this crazy and chaotic mysterious world, actions aren't for others to see, but for myself. 
A person can fool humans and even deities, but they can't fool themselves. Uh, I wonder if high-sequence Bayonders from the spectator pathway can fool themselves. As Klein's thoughts raced, he took out Grossel's travels that he hid near his chest, intending to smear the curly-haired baboon's blood over its cover. At that moment, his heart tensed up as the hair along his neck stood up. This was an intense premonition of danger, and in this premonition, no scene had surfaced in Klein's mind. Not good. Klein instantly found his heart wrapped in layers of shadows as everything before his eyes seemed to be covered in a layer of dark glass. Without the luxury of time to consider what was happening, the glove on his left palm turned transparent once again. His figure turned invisible before he appeared beside Alger, reaching out to grab his shoulder. At that instant, Alger also sensed the abnormality. His heart contracted and expanded like the source of a storm as his blood surged through his veins and arteries like a tidal wave. Meanwhile, he saw Jamin Sparrow's right hand which was grabbing his shoulder. From the fingernails, it was turning gray and turning dull, bit by bit, just like any stone that could be found anywhere in the dark forests. And his feet, knees, and muscles were turning stiff as though they no longer belonged to him. The two figures quickly turned transparent as they vanished from their location and entered a saturated and clearly overlapped spirit world as they quickly traversed it in the direction of the ancient ruins. Suddenly, the red, green, black, and other stacked colors before Klein's eyes uniformly darkened as they produced fine patterns that resembled raven black hair. Raven black hair. A chill rose up from their souls as Klein didn't hesitate to leave the spirit world with the hanged man and return to the real world where they landed in an area mixed with rubble and weed. Not far away was a mostly collapsed building. Through the corner of his eye, the hanged man had already turned grayish-white from the waist down, as though he had turned into a stone sculpture. Ta! Klein snapped his fingers, igniting the grass tens of meters away in preparation to leap over. At that moment, he suddenly felt his heart palpitate as his body began to tremble involuntarily. The appearance of the soaring flames was terrifying to him. The weakness death knell gave him this time, fear of fire. Seeing the dark glass thicken before his eyes, Klein felt a howling wind sweep him up from below before he could overcome the fear, causing him and Alger to fly up, passing through the invisible border and entering the vicinity of the ancient ruins. Bang! The duo fell to the ground simultaneously, producing the sound of crashing rocks. The thick shadow over their hearts vanished as the danger that hid in the darkness receded like the tide. Phew. Klein heaved a sigh of relief as he saw the grayish-white color that had spread to his elbow turn faint and recede. His back was covered in perspiration that soaked his shirt, and what left him most horrified was that he didn't know what monster had attacked him or what powers were used. Did Death Nell's gunshot alarm some monster in the vicinity, or is it the existence that rules over this forest at night? Thankfully, it doesn't dare to enter the vicinity of the ancient ruins. This isn't necessarily good. This means that deep in the ancient ruins is something that makes it fearful. I should be prepared to retreat at any moment. Klein stretched his hands and slowly stood up. At this moment, Alger escaped from that grayish-white layer as he turned his head to glance over. That zone was petrifying us. That zone. Petrification. Klein nodded in thought as he walked towards the mostly collapsed building that was strewn with weeds and covered in vines. He then replied in a deep tone, The problem now lies ahead. Alger didn't speak further as he sped up his pace, steadily walking by his side. After approaching, Klein looked at the building. His gaze swept the spires and stone columns, as well as the damaged walls that remained standing. He stopped and asked seemingly casually, What kind of building do you think this ruin was in the past? Alger remained silent for a few seconds before saying, Cathedral. A cathedral. 